To say that I am deeply honored <laughs> to be here is an understatement. What a pleasure to be addressing you from all over the world. I think it's fair to say that there are some of you in the audience who have never touched the ocean. But in the next few minutes, I want to answer a few questions. First of all, what is the ocean? Secondly, how do we know? Third, why should we care? And finally, <laughs> what should we, what should you, what should all of us be doing to take care of that vast blue living ocean that makes our existence possible? First, what is the ocean? Well, mostly water and salt. But what sets the ocean on Earth apart from all of the other water in the universe that we know about? And there's a lot of it. There's moon, water on the moon, there's water on Mars. Throughout the universe, it, water has been identified as a fairly common substance. But only here on Earth is there a living ocean, and it goes way back early in the four and a half billion year history of this planet. It's because of life, mostly microbes, the little guys, that have altered the chemistry of water, H2O, hydrogen, oxygen, and rocks, all of the other elements that make up the hard parts of the planet, rocks and water, plus life, over a long period of time have made Earth habitable for us. It's taken us a fairly short period of time to go from a planet that has worked in our favor to one that is perilously moving not in our favor. So, we know the average depth of the ocean is about 4,000 meters, about two and a half miles. For those of you who know about that great shipwreck, the Titanic, it's the average depth of the ocean is about where the Titanic rests in the North Atlantic Ocean. The maximum, 11 kilometers, seven miles down, the deepest part of the ocean. We know that life is most abundant in the ocean. After all, all of life requires water, and 97% of Earth's water is ocean. It's the place where most of life on Earth lives, and it lives mostly in the dark, because sunlight penetrates, you know, for photosynthesis, for the green things in the ocean to capture carbon, generate oxygen. You know, it goes down to maybe 200, even 300 meters, but that's just the surface water. Think of how much of the ocean is below where sunlight penetrates. It's where most of life on Earth actually exists, not only living in the dark, but the water gets pretty cold, even in equatorial places when you get down to as much as, as even a hundred meters, let alone a thousand meters, and that's just as the beginning. Remember, the average depth is 4,000 meters, the maximum 11. It's dark, illuminated by bioluminescence, illuminated by living light, like firefly light. So, okay, the ocean. How do we know? Really, most of what we know about the ocean has been discovered in my lifetime. It wasn't that long ago that people really imagined that when you left shore, you had to be careful, you might fall off the edge. We have learned so much so fast that literally, since the middle of the 20th century, more has been learned about the ocean than during all preceding history. How do we know? We know because we've mastered the ability to do what the highest flying birds and insects cannot do. We've gone 
into space above, look back on Earth and seen from afar that the world is blue. It's blue. It's mostly ocean. We're not just talking surface. About two-thirds of the surface of the Earth is ocean. But it's that depth, the average depth, going all the way to the greatest depth, filled with life. We did not know when I was a child that life exists from the surface all the way down to the deepest part of the ocean. It's no wonder we didn't know. People had not been there. It's only in my time, your time, that it has been established how the ocean not only is filled with life, but that it shapes planetary chemistry and temperature. The two big themes of why, what, what things keep us alive, it's temperature within a certain range. It's the chemistry of Earth that is unique in the universe because of life that has shaped rocks and water into a habitable planet. Okay, why should you care <laughs> about what we now know that was not knowable until we had technology to go high in the sky and deep in the sea? I must say, I am, I, I feel so privileged to have arrived just when I did at the beginning of ocean exploration using little submersibles, using diving techniques, using equipment that my parents could not use because it did not exist. No one knew, not even Einstein, the smartest, one of the smartest humans on the planet, or any of the other great thinkers prior to the middle of the 20th century knew what is now known that is available to you. That imagine if we did not know that the world is basically blue. Imagine if we did not know that the ocean is in trouble. In my lifetime, not only has more been learned, more has literally been lost since the middle of the 20th century lost because of what we're putting into the ocean and lost because of what we're taking out of the ocean on a scale that is unprecedented in the history of life on Earth. So, think about it. Go back 10,000 years ago, world population numbered in the low millions of people. Fast forward to a thousand years ago when Polynesian explorers were taking off across the Pacific, exploring their blue home. They did not know what was under their canoes, but they did know that they could travel following the stars. Information that they and others of our predecessors have passed along. To, we are the beneficiaries of that knowing of that understanding. Go back only 500 years ago, world population was only about a half a billion. That's when the great European explorers began and the Chinese explorers also began exploring the planet in ways that had not been possible because the technology did not exist that made possible our species to roam as far and wide more recently, as deep as we now can go. It wasn't until 1960, 1960. It's a long time ago in some measures, but when you think in all the history of humankind, it's just this little piece of time that we've been able to go to the deepest part of the ocean. In 1960, two men in a little submersible, the Trieste, went to the depths, the greatest depth, in the Mariana Trench. And most importantly, they came back. I mean, one-way trips are really easy. <laughs> but it's making the descent, returning, and then sharing the view. It was 50 years, 52 years, before anybody go, got to go back. And that was in the time when it was actually my fellow explorer at the National Geographic, James Cameron, who's a filmmaker, an artist, but also an explorer, 
with a lot of engineering savvy, helped develop the sub that he used, one person going to the deepest part of the ocean. And since then, another explorer, who's also a businessman, Victor Boscovo, an individual who yearned to go into the deepest part of the ocean. He's not an engineer, but he worked with engineers to develop a system that has taken him repeatedly, solo and with others, out into the deepest part of the ocean. Okay, but here we are in 2022, and only about a dozen people, about the same number of people who walked on the moon, have been to the deepest part of the ocean. That's real progress compared to where we were not so long ago. But the great thing is, knowing that the greatest era of exploration of the ocean is just beginning. On your watch, right now, the technology that makes it possible not only to go to the moon, maybe to Mars, and elsewhere in the universe, but to get to know this part of the solar system, this part of the universe. Presently, only about maybe 10% of the ocean has been seen by anyone at all, other than creatures of the sea, I mean by humans. About 20% has been mapped with the same degree of accuracy that we have for the moon and Mars and the rest of the terrestrial parts of Earth. We've got a long way to go to really know the nature of the ocean. Our excursions into the ocean, even though some of us have had the great pleasure of spending as much as two weeks, some even more, living underwater, getting to know the creatures in the sea personally, getting to know their faces, their personality, that knowing that fish <laughs> speak to one another, knowing the nature of the complexity of life in the sea, knowing the importance of taking care of the systems, this complex interaction of, of diverse forms of life that make our existence possible. They shape planetary chemistry. The ocean really shapes climate and weather. Knowing this now, that we did not know that until quite recently, should cause us to look at the ocean with new eyes, a new sense of caring, especially when we now know that literally on my watch, 90% of many of the big fish in the ocean have been extracted by us. We've seen a decline of creatures such as tuna, swordfish, cod, whales, turtles, you name it. We are the greatest predator on the planet, consuming life in the ocean at the same time that we put things into the ocean that are causing planetary chemistry and planetary temperature to change. Imagine if we did not know, first of all, what the ocean is and why it matters to everyone, everywhere, all the time. I, I'm asked sometimes, what's your favorite sea creature? And I've got a long list. But number one, I have to say, is you, my fellow humans. We are all sea creatures because we all depend on the ocean for every drop of water we drink, every breath of air we take, most of the oxygen in the atmosphere has been generated over very long periods of time and continues today, mostly from the ocean. Of course, from trees and grass and other green things on the land, but it's the ocean that really drives the way the world works. It's in trouble because of what we've taken out and what we've put in. Imagine again, if you didn't know, that we would continue to take from the ocean and put things into the ocean that are causing the ocean to change. But think of the possibilities that you now have. First of all, dive in. It doesn't matter who you are or where you live, there's water somewhere near where you are. Take the plunge. Get a face mask. See what lives in the, in the water. Take some time. It doesn't matter what else you do. Getting to know your blue planet 
should be a priority. And then think, what can I do that can make a difference? Look at what you eat. Look at what we're doing that has an impact on nature. And then think of this, that we need to take care of the ocean, what we put in, what we take out, how much we protect. The United Nations, many countries, at least 80 countries now have committed to embrace land and sea, nature, with enhanced respect and care, 30% by 2030. Your, your watch, your time, my time, our time. Everything that we do that takes from nature has a cost. Everything that we do to protect even small parts of the land, even small parts of the ocean, really make a big difference in terms of safeguarding those systems, planetary chemistry, planetary temperature. Presently, only about 3% of the ocean is highly or fully protected. About 15% of the land is safeguarded in parks and reserves and policies that protect migratory species like, like birds. But in the ocean, we're just beginning to recognize why the ocean matters and also what we can do going forward to turn from decline to make this the most important time, the best time, to go and hold in your mind what is the best planet there can be. You may have heard or listened to Mary Robinson speaking yesterday about maybe the best planet is, is to come. It's possible. That's why you should be excited to be a 21st century human being armed with knowledge, armed with the opportunity that has never been possible before because we did not know until right about now that we need to protect nature. We need to protect the ocean as if our lives depend on it because they do. Thank you.